Hi there, today we're going to be talking about the rotator cuff, its muscles, innervations, and its actions, what it does and how it helps us throughout our day. Welcome to Ortho Eval Pal, where we help you build confidence in your orthopedic evaluation and management skills. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 15 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Marquis, and today we have a loaded podcast that we are going to be talking about the rotator cuff. Now, I can give a seven hour lecture on the rotator cuff and the shoulder and I have done it several times in the past. So to try to fit everything about the rotator cuff into one podcast is going to be difficult. That's why we're going to kind of break this up into different segments like rotator cuff tendonitis versus tendinopathy and rotator cuff impingement versus a rotator cuff tear. And we'll talk about those different concepts. So I also like to talk a little bit about post-operative care of the rotator cuff. And uh, so today I just wanted to kind of get back to the basics. I don't want to make this super complicated for you, but I think there are some really key points here that are super important uh, in regards to the rotator cuff, how it functions and uh, what it does for us. So first thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, the muscles. Okay. So we all should remember this. It's a SITS muscle, S-I-T-S, with supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Now, it's important that you know where these attach. Okay. So your supraspinatus attaches to your greater tubercle. Infraspinatus and teres minor also attach to the greater tubercle. So they help to kind of get the arm elevated and externally rotated. Whereas the subscapularis has an origin on the in, inner subscapular fossa and attaches to the lesser tubercle and helps with internal rotation. Now, why does the rotator cuff uh, become such a big player here, but it's such a small muscle group, okay? Because you have all these other muscles, the deltoids, the lats, the teres major, um, the pec uh, musculature, and those muscles are almost never affected. Uh, they, they just, it's very, very rare that you see those big, large muscles affected. And part of it is that the rotator cuff is at a mechanical disadvantage because of its size, its attachment, and the long lever arm that it has to pull on. So, um, so, so what exactly are the innervations of the rotator cuff? Well, let's start with the supraspinatus uh, and infraspinatus. Those are both innervated by the suprascapular nerve. That's important to remember because I'm going to be doing an episode here talking about the six different reasons why people have loss of external rotation, active loss of external rotation, and this is one of them. Damage to the, the, um, subs the suprascapular nerve can cause uh, some shutdown of the rotator cuff, become very weak in external rotation, and can look just like a rotator cuff tear. So let's remember that one. The subscapularis is innervated by the subscapular nerve, very rarely damaged, and the uh, teres minor is uh, innervated by the lower branch of the axillary nerve, and also another one that is very seldomly uh, ever uh, damaged or um, injured. So let's talk about the actions a little bit. The, you need to now visualize this because obviously uh, we're not doing a, a live a video or a CME course here. So you need to envision this, that supraspinatus muscle attaches uh, at the most superior aspect of the greater tubercle. So really it helps to abduct the shoulder and get it elevated for the first 30 degrees or so. It's what initiates that motion. The other thing that uh, the uh, supraspinatus does, it helps to depress that humeral head a little bit, and we'll talk about that, um, which is super important here in just a little bit. The infraspinatus is primarily an external rotator, and so is the teres minor. And so when somebody has loss of strength and external rotation, those are the two big ones. And then the uh, subscapularis, uh, that produces internal rotation of the arm, especially with the elbow next to your side. So that's the best way to test it. Uh, we'll go through shoulder special tests here also in a future podcast. The other uh, important aspect of the subscapularis is the major stabilizer. It helps to really hold the, uh, the humeral head into the glenoid. And uh, so a, a very important muscle there. Uh, not torn as often as the supra and infraspinatus muscles, but um, significant when it happens. So let's talk a little bit about something I like to call the inverse hammock effect. Now, you need to visualize this. You're out on the beach. There's a hammock tied between two palm trees. There's a little sag in the bottom of it. The first thing you want to do is jump in it and just veg and relax, um, which would be nice, especially on these cold winter days that we're having in northern Maine. But 
Imagine that hammock uh, has a big beach ball inside of it. You go to one side of the hammock and you pull on it. That beach ball is going to head upward, correct? Now, I want you to imagine that we can take this hammock and turn it upside down and it stays basically in the same position but upside down and the beach ball still stays in it. And so basically it's tied to both palm trees. You pull on one side and the hammock will go downward and push that beach ball downward, okay? Your rotator cuff does the same thing, okay? Your rotator cuff is super instrumental when it comes to humeral head depression. Your humeral head needs to, to go downward when you start to actively elevate your arm, okay? So not only does your rotator cuff help to get your arm initiated into elevation, external and internal rotation, but it helps to depress the humeral head upon elevation. By doing this, we decrease the amount of impingement between the greater tubercle and the acromion, and we also significantly decrease the amount of superior migration in the glenoid, causing erosion of the superior glenoid labrum. Well, you, you, you erode that labrum and you decrease the amount of cartilage on the superior aspect of the joint, and the humeral head will continue to migrate this will break down the joint a lot faster, cause a lot of impingement, cause a lot of pain, shut down, dysfunction, and poor quality of life. So, strengthening is a must. Remember, your rotator cuff is super dynamic here in holding the, that, that inherently unstable joint together. It works all the time, okay? If you're laying on your back, laying on your stomach, laying on your side, it works all the time to help hold that, uh, that humerus into the glenoid. So, we need to strengthen it. Now, with that being said, overstrengthening that rotator cuff can cause a lot of problems also if you're stressing it too hard because remember, it has this little attachment, it's this little muscle lifting this long lever. So I always make it a point to start strengthening the rotator cuff with the arm close to the side as much as possible for internal external rotation. I emphasize strengthening into external rotation a lot, doing high repetitions and low weight and then slowly starting to build that up. When I do flexion and abduction, I also keep that in an impringement-free position to help start to activate that rotator cuff, okay? So it helps elevate the arm, but more importantly, it helps to uh, approximate the glenoid and humerus together. And really, in my opinion, the most important thing is to decrease or, or depress the humeral head when you're trying to elevate the arm. That rotator cuff has different integrity when you're 18 versus when you're 65, 70, 80 years old. So when it comes time to repairing the rotator cuff, looking at that integrity um, is very important, especially on post-operative rehab and recovery times and recovery rates. The, the rotator cuff tendon doesn't have a lot of blood flow in it. It, it gets impinged a lot on the acromion and therefore really starts to fray like rubbing a rope on a rock and that over time will break it down, cause some problems. Um, and then as you become older, the integrity of that cuff, that tendon is not as good. So, you know, it's the difference between uh, an 18 year old rotator cuff that is like leather versus an 85 year old rotator cuff that could be like, you know, wet toilet paper. And the, uh, that can really make a difference as far as rehabilitating the cuff. So it's important to get good blood flow to the cuff. I like heating the cuff uh, as much as possible to help increase perfusion to that area. And I always uh, work on decreasing the amount of impingement to the shoulder. So that's my little tidbit on the rotator cuff today. And the rotator cuff does so much, but I don't want to keep you too long on this because I want to really focus on other aspects of the rotator cuff. Uh, in future episodes. So if you have any questions, uh, get to our uh, website at uh, orthovalpal.com. Make sure you sign in for our newsletter. And, um, and if you do, you'll get podcasts as soon as they come out, which is going to be every Tuesday at noontime. So thanks for listening. Take care and we'll see you at episode 16. We hope you've enjoyed this video. And for more awesome content, go to orthoevalpal.com. Can't wait to see you there.